Welcome to Real People, Real Voices. I'm your host, James Jackson. And I'm Pastor Wayne Moore. It's going to be a great show on today. Thanks for joining us again. You know, Dr. Moore, uh, this is our, I think, third show. It's our third show, and we're being blessed. Yeah. Uh, and I God think is blessing us. I think the community is being blessed, too. I do. I really do. I think uh, we're being utilized in a way that will help the community, and the community uh, will understand that there's somebody who has a real voice uh, them. Yeah, and we have Nathaniel Williams. Doctor. 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 I call him Dr. Nate. He wants to be called Dr. That's Nate. That's what he needs to be called. The yeah. man is major. He's major. He has some great things to share with the community, some things that the community needs to know about, and we need to be attentive to what he has to say because our children, whether you believe it or not, in the city of Indianapolis and in some other areas are in uh, bad shape. Yeah, you know, education is big. Education, right. And uh, that's going to be the focus of this show, talking yeah. about the importance of education, what's going on in education in the city of Indianapolis. Right. I'm going to talk about the mind trust. Right, right. So f families need to understand that. Yeah. And we ought not to be afraid to talk about it because our children are a part of that. And that's something that uh, at the urging of then Mayor Bart Peterson, right. they started that, they put it together. Uh, we got a lot to share with regard to that. Right. And Dr. Nate's going to help us out. Let's see if it's working. All right. We're going to let him introduce himself, too, when he gets here. Yeah. So we want you to stay tuned right here on Real People, Real Voices. It's going to be a great show that all your friends, family, associates, and neighbors know that they want to tune in every week to watch the show. They will never be the same again. In just a few moments, Dr. Nate's going to be joining us. going to be talking about educational issues in the city of Indianapolis that not only will benefit Indianapolis, but benefit the entire nation. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to Real People, Real Voices. Today, uh, Dr. Moore, we've got Dr. Nathaniel Williams, yes. affectionately known as Dr. Nate. Yes, great educator, great informer, great communicator, and he's going to uh, give us some insight on our educational system and what's going on uh, in the city of Indianapolis and what parents need to be very much aware of that could help them um, as it relates to their children in the public school system. We're going to let him introduce himself. Tell yeah. him. And as I understand it, uh, as he as he's about to introduce himself, yeah. he got his Ph.D. at IUPUI. Right, right. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. Welcome to the show, Dr. Nate. Well, thank you both for having me on here today. Um, uh, as stated, I am currently an assistant professor at Knox College, which is in the middle of nowhere of Illinois. <laughs> it's about 45 minutes west of Peoria. Uh, born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana. Attended IPS first grade through 12th grade, graduated from Broad Ripple High School, so go Rockets. Oh my yeah. God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm a space pioneer. <laughs> Northwest. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's extraordinary that uh, you went through IPS mm -hmm. and now you are a college professor. Correct. Um, so that's outstanding. Thank you. Do you think that uh, the education that our youth are receiving now is still at the standard that it was when you were going through it? Mm, great question. I think that, um, for one, education has always been in flux, um, especially when it comes to folks who come from our community. There has been time and time again where public education has failed us. 
Now, we all have our shining examples or um, exception to the case, so for myself. Um, I think the biggest thing is not to necessarily frame the past as it always being well, because we've known it's always had its shortcomings, but to really look at the failures now and how they're framed now and what we can do about them. Okay. How are they framed? Well, um, first of all, let's talk about the failures. Right. Would you agree yeah, with I that, think, Pat? I think so, yeah. And then the, the framing of them. Well, I, I think you have to start at the beginning. So the first um, compensatory uh, education was in Massachusetts, I want to say in 1831, uh, maybe a little bit off on the date. But 470 years, public education has always had this aspiration of regardless of who you are, where you come from, you go into public education, you can come out and be whoever you want to be. And once again, we've always had examples throughout history, especially within our own communities, where folks have done that. They've beaten the odds and you know, have surpassed all obstacles. However, when we look at the aggregate, the average, the average person, that story hasn't always been true. And on average, it hasn't been true. So nowadays, um, failures frame pretty much in kind of three different ways. One, you have the failure of teachers, the failure of the system, the failure of public education in general. So that's where a lot of your ed reformers like to intersect and say, well, the system's broken and we need to fix it. Now you have your traditional folks who will say that, yeah, the system has its failures and its shortcomings, but we're progressing and we're doing better. But you know, we're not as bad as they would like to make us think. Uh, myself, as, along with other critical scholars, believe that failure has always been embedded in the system. It's always been kind of lopsided, where we have always been at the bottom of the totem pole. So in regards to framing those failures, that's pretty much how they lie. OK. OK. The, so, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Pastor Jackson, go ahead. Well, you talk about uh, failures being embedded into the system. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, is that something intentional or unintentional? It, it's unintentional, um, partly because we really have not had an authentic kind of in-depth conversation about what the role of public education is in the first place. Uh, initially, public education was designed, one, to get uh, a lot of poor immigrants off the streets and into some type of facility. You know, they were uh, breaking into factories, you know, doing kid things. So we needed to get them off the streets. In addition, we need to Americanize a lot of the immigrants that were coming in in the 19th century, and particularly the Irish and the Italians. So really, public education was really set up to, one, indoctrinate people in what it, what it means to be a citizen in this country, uh, but then also, two, the idea of setting you up to participate in our economy. Okay. And that was kind of the, the, the spirit behind it. But inevitably, um, history has always kind of put us at the appendix. Okay. You know, we've been left out. And then uh, through the efforts of abolitionists, um, through um, just good folks who had good spirits trying to make ways for us throughout history, we've actually tried to do that. But inevitably, we've always kind of come up against this re uh, resistance. OK. OK. Where are the failures in our system in our city? Mm. Are there any failures? First of all, let me, are there any failures? Yes. Okay. And what are they? Um, currently, right now, we're having uh, the failure, one, of democracy. A lot of times, there's this rhetoric or this storytelling of choice, right? You have the choice to send your child wherever you would like to ch uh, so choose. And it sounds good on the surface, but inevitably, slowly but surely, uh, the democratic rights of everyday citizens are being taken away, and you have this foreign interest, in particular big money coming in, and taking away our own democracy, our own ability to put people from our own communities in spaces of power to make the policy that would best benefit our own children. So that's one big failure. Uh, on top of that, you have the exploitation of our children again. So throughout history, uh, especially in American history, um, you've had black children on auction blocks. Um, and it's come in a lot of different forms, whether it be literal and now, you could almost say literal, but figurative. Our kids are now walking around with dollar signs. And now they're looking for the next buyer. Who's going to buy your kid? It's not necessarily about the learning um, styles of that child or what's best for that child. It's about how much money that child can bring into my facility. Okay. 
Well, I know you mentioned uh, <laughs> yeah. black children, but uh, IPS mm -hmm. has a large number of white children as well. Right. So I, I think the problem is, is not limited to black children. And in fact, they have a, um, a pretty good percentage of Latino mm -hmm. young people as well. So when we start talking about the uh, public school system, and in our next segment, we'll kind of get uh, into a little bit deeper with regard to the Mind Trust, um, mayoral uh, um, directed or mayoral managed mm -hmm. uh, charter schools uh, versus charter schools that are operated or uh, managed by others. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it appears to me that a lot of children across the board are suffering with regard to what you were talking about. Yeah, definitely. Um, IPS has a substantial uh, white population and it's very much segregated to the south side of Indianapolis. So um, our you know, poor Appalachian brothers and sisters on the south side are still affected by this just as much as our Latino brothers uh, and sisters on the more predominantly on the west side of Indianapolis. So it's not necessarily definitively only attacking us. It is universal in that sense. But it's an also important to know that IPS, um, kind of almost in a reverse desegregation manner, created highly white populated schools, particular to the north side of Indianapolis. And if anyone is familiar with geographically how Indianapolis is laid out, the north side is more wealthier, more affluent. There's no highways or uh, highly populated streets that go through these neighborhoods. The wealthiest citizens in the city, really in the county, live in that particular area. And they've created this installation bubble where although there is a substantial white population in IPS, it's predominantly black, but yet you have 85% white uh, schools. Okay. Okay, I, well, think, I think there was something in Indianapolis yeah. Star about um, very, uh, very wealthy right. uh, IPS school right. uh, up north, to your point. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think we can kind of spread this out, and we'll come back and talk about that yeah. in, in just a little bit. So we want you all to stay with us here on Real People, Real Voices, as we get down into, even deeper, down into the issue of education. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to Real People, Real Voices with your host. I'm James Jackson. And I'm Pastor Moore. And we're talking about, you know, Dr. Moore, it's very interesting. And Dr. Nate uh, has given us some uh, history. Right. Dating all the way back to the mid-1800s uh, with regard to education. I'm learning a lot on this show. Yeah. yeah I think he's uh, right, right, give, giving us information that will help us understand why we are where we are today and why we see the big interest now. Uh, in big business, uh, tapping into education the way that they're tapping into it. And he's going to give us some more insight on that. Yeah, and I think it's important. Uh, Dr. Moore used the terminology big business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've even been approached as pastor in the community, the church I pastor, um, by folks saying, hey, we're coming in and uh, we're starting a new charter school. Um, I mean, the, pro the pro proliferation of mm. charter schools is just growing and growing and growing. Yeah, um, back in 1991, the first charter school in Minnesota uh, was legislated. Uh, so we've had roughly 25 years of intervention. Um, charter schools initially were birthed out of rebellion. Right? They, they, we know the very top-heavy traditional public schools, and you had a group of teachers said, we're fed up with it, we're going to create our own school. So, I mean, I'm very much kind of uh, allured by the idea of something being so kind of like, yes, we're going to fight the, the system. Uh, but inevitably, over time, you've had kind of the big business interests come in and see this as an opportunity to exploit. And it, it's, it's important to understand that the folks who work in these spaces who genuinely want to see our kids do better um, are not a part of the larger critique that I have of this movement. Because I know I've seen folks on both sides of the aisle on this issue, and a lot of people are just genuinely there for our children. But inevitably, you have people who exploit this movement to benefit themselves and in the process remap Indianapolis as a core. And Indianapolis is not unique to this. This has happened throughout the world for over 40 years. Um, Chicago is probably the easiest example for everyone. You know, 
when I was a kid, downtown Chicago, you make sure you was close to your parent, you didn't leave your car for too long, and you, you know, you make sure you didn't go down certain areas. Now it's like $30 to park downtown Chicago for an hour, let alone I can never think about affording somewhere down there. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> I had this group on, uh, on a hotel downtown Chicago. It was very, very low, real nice hotel. And I didn't know when I got down there, uh, the guy at the parking, he said, that's going to be $75. That was more than hotel call. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a part of a, a larger initiative. Once again, it's not localized just Indianapolis. It's happening in at least 39 other urban cities in the nation. But once again, it's happened in other countries in the past. What you have is a concentration of power and wealth in the urban city. And as a result, you displace those who are disenfranchised of low socioeconomic status, the poor folks, out to the rural areas. So if you look at major cities in Europe, uh, across Africa and South America, it's not uncommon that the capital would be kind of the epicenter of wealth. You know, that's where all the money is. That's where everyone of, of status lives, and then everyone else kind of lives in the slums on the skirts. Now, this has kind of been uh, stapled off or kind of pushed off in the Americas uh, for a while, but what we saw in Chile in South America in the mid-60s, you had this guy named Milton Friedman, uh, an economist, that very much believed in this philosophy of competition. To your point about charter schools and the continual expansion, the idea that competition would drive performance. You know, logically, it kind of makes sense. You know, competition, you'll compete harder. But the problem is, as a cognitive psychologist, I don't know where that data is in literature. I don't see where you can equate motivation equally or, uh, as competition will always translate to academic achievement. And the problem is, is that in a history of competition where we really don't make the rules, we're usually the ones that lose. Doc, Dr. Nate, so you're basically saying this myth of competition in education is exactly a myth. Yeah. What is your, 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 your personal take on the success the rise and the success of charter schools in Indianapolis? Well, I mean, I, it doesn't even have to be my own personal. Um, what does the data say? The data says it's pretty clear. Um, we have had high performing charter schools, middle performing charter schools, and some really bad charter schools. You had traditional public schools that have been high performing, some in the middle, some poor. Study after study for over 25 years has shown that charter schools don't outperform traditional public schools. Uh, most parents believe that, oh, well, this intervention, this, this is the solution to our problem. But the data says that it's not. And inevitably what happens, and we can think about the um, publication from the Indianapolis Star, you have a resegregation of cities, and you have a reestablishment of where you're supposed to be. That's interesting. And, you know, we, we talked uh, earlier about the Mind Trust mm -hmm. and uh, going back to 2001. But it's not um, limited to the city of Indianapolis. One source had indicated that uh, most local governments want to change traditional public schools to uh, public schools that are controlled by the mayor's office. Yeah, Chicago um, public schools tried this experiment, and once again, it's you lose the democratic process in that idea. So no longer are we voting for our neighbors, our relatives who live in our community to represent us and our opinions on the board. Now you have the entire city giving more or less a king the right. ruling control over our school system. So you're basically saying the person who's in the community and has a great desire mm -hmm. to be on the school board mm -hmm. will have a problem now. Yeah, the, it'll be non-existent. So in Chicago Public Schools, CPS, the board is appointed. And most people don't know that in most charter schools, if not all charter schools in Indianapolis, the board is appointed. So if you wanted to charter, start a charter school, we could be on your board just because, you know, we're your boys. So inevitably, there's no democratic process in that. So if I have a complaint, who do I go to? Oh, these are your comrades. These are the people that you work with. So. That idea that I, as an individual, as a parent, have the authority to go to um, a public official, a school board elect, or a legislator, that power goes away. And so our children suffer. Suffer. Wow. Well, Dr. Nate, we really appreciate you uh, coming and spending time with us today and enlightening us well, and letting us know 
uh, how things are working. And, and the information is so powerful right. and profound. We don't have enough time to get what we need. <laughs> I think we ought to have you back at some point. Yeah, I point. think we do. So yeah. thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. And we want those of you who are watching to stay with us. Dr. Moore and I, we're going to come back with the rundown. Yes. In just a few more minutes. I think uh, that what we're talking about with regard to education, you've been informed now. We'd like to hear from you. You can uh, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave us some information there with regard to what you think about education in the city of Indianapolis. We'll be back with the wrap-up segment after this. I got smart about saving for college. And now my daughter's off to a great start. When it comes to your money, whatever you want to get smart about, you can find it at smartaboutmoney.org. We got smart about loans. And sign here. Now it's our house we're going home to. I got smart about preparing for those unexpected challenges. Now I know at least my finances will be healthy. Smart About Money is a free online resource. We are a non-commercial, non-profit organization dedicated to helping people just like you get information about money. For everything from how to build an emergency fund to how to deal with job uncertainty, smartaboutmoney.org has the answers you've been looking for. I got Smart About Credit. Would you like paper or plastic? Now paper or plastic has a whole new meaning. Smartaboutmoney.org, the easy place to start when you want to get smart about your finances. Welcome back to Real People, Real Voices. I'm James Jackson. And I'm Pastor Wayne Moore. And uh, you know, Dr. Moore, that last segment uh, with Dr. Nate with regard to education, uh, he took us all the way back and brought us all the way forward to give us a different perspective on what's going on with education. And he explained to us it really hadn't changed much, uh, and, but there's some different things and methods going on that we need to be very much aware of. He's very informative. We need to have him back. Yeah, you know, he talked about debunking in, in his bio, debunking myths right. about education, specifically with regard to charter schools. I mean, charter schools are popping up uh, everywhere, right. which, which is not um, a big problem per se, but uh, a lot of people are saying, well, it, it provides competition for other schools. And as Dr. Nate said, it's, that's not a big deal. He, he basically told us that Competition in education hinders the growth of students. And uh, we need to get back to uh, educating uh, instead of co competing. And I think when you look at the charter system, that's what you see, competition. Um, and to, to have him talk about that and to see it in our communities, it's, it's, it's astronomical. And we need to, to, to really pay, pay attention to that because our children are at risk. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, now, IPS, they have uh, their own charter schools then. Right. Which I think is an interesting development. Right, right. And do you think that um, the other charter schools that have been coming on uh, were the catalyst for IPS developing that fellow fellowship program? Well, I, I, I kind of think, and I don't actually, this is what I think. I think that the charter schools that were out before IPS were used as a, a model for IPS. And so now that IPS has seen what other charter schools can do or have done, they'll take the data and create their own system of charter schools. And they would probably feel that they have an up on, 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 on the idea of charter schools. Yeah, and it's still developing, so we'll see how that goes. I want to thank those of you who are watching for joining us today on Real People, Real Voices. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us back here every week. Thanks.